Good afternoon, welcome to EduSat Network. Friend, you know today we have lecture on ethnography. Firstly, we will try to understand the basic of ethnography like what is ethnography, how it can be useful for social science research, what is its advantage and limitation and then we will also talk about from the perspective of problem like what ethnographer face while doing the research and how they manage the situation when difficult situation come out. In, uh, as you know that ethnographers go in the natural setup and there they live together with the people and uh, then they do research. So a lot number, a lot number of uh, problems they face and they overcome it and don't uh, express. So there are certain uh, things which need to be careful for you know, doing the ethnographic research. So we'll try to understand all the aspects, all the dimension of this uh, type of research. So, and for discussion on this very topic, we have in the studio Dr. Emin Thakur, an academician, thinker, and he writes on different issues, different newspaper, and uh, has written two books and regularly contributes in national and international journals. So I think his knowledge and experience will help us to understand this topic. And he is also associate professor of political science, one of the premier university of the country, Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. So on his behalf, I welcome him for the EduSat lecture. Thank you, Amranji. Uh, what I will do today is I will talk about the basic idea of ethnography and what are the issues uh, in this kind of research method and then I will give some examples to demonstrate how ethnography can be uh, actually used for social science research. Uh, let me begin with the idea that uh, it is a qualitative method as we have discussed earlier. We are focusing on the qualitative method, method of social science research. It is qualitative because we do not play with numbers in this case. We are not concerned with the numbers in this case. We are rather concerned about the thought process, the social process. Therefore, we call it ethnographic research. This is basically the term comes from ethnic graphy, means you, you create a graph, graphical presentation of the ethnic community. That is the basic idea. So, it is an in depth study of community, society, or, 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 uh, or group. Ethnography basically emerged as a research method for anthropologists. You know, and the anthropologists were uh, finding this kind of method more useful when they wanted to know about the other society. Because as you know that um, if one society is an ethnic community uh, and it has its own way of thinking about things, when the outsiders try to understand the society, they try to understand from their own perspective. They try to make sense from their own, own uh, um, epistemic understanding. So it would happen at times that when they encountered new kind of societies, they found their own method, own epistemic framework totally irrelevant for understanding the other society. So that is how this emerged with colonialism and the ethnography uh, was a tool of anthropologists basically and that too the colonial anthropologist. You know that anthropology itself is basically a colonial, colonial project. It is when the colonial power started moving around the world, they wanted to know the other society. So, they used this kind of thing. Gradually, uh, gradually uh, this ethnography became one of the major tools of understanding cultures, uh, different cultures. So, it is it's used for understanding the cultural traits of society, it is used for understanding the way people think, the way people behave and it is a very subjective data that they collect. There is no number that they collect. This basically if you look at the history of ethnography, this basically emerged with uh, uh, as a tool of research in a big way with Malinowski's uh, who was an American anthropologist, his research of Trobiant uh, Island and he wanted to find out the social life of the tribal community. And then uh, before the Great Depression, 
when you know the methods of social sciences were actually in trouble because the depression was going on and a lot of uh, anxiety in society was there. So that time the Chicago students, Chicago University students were, uh, were actually um, allowed to undertake this kind of research and that triggered off uh, ethnographic research as a major tool in social sciences. Now, gradually the mainstream sociology has adopted this and mainstream sociology particularly to work on the marginalized communities uh, uses ethnography uh, in, in, a, in a major way. But also the political scientists have started gradually using ethnography as a tool of research. Uh, for instance, a Center for Studies of Developing Societies uh, in Delhi, which undertakes a major uh, election study every time. Earlier they used to conduct election studies through survey method. Uh, of late, since last few elections, they are experimenting with ethnographic study of elections and they want to understand how do people vote, how people vote in, in complex societies. So, gra gradually even the political scientists are picking up ethnography as one of the major tools of of research. There are many, uh, many examples that I will uh, come across of my own students who have used ethnography uh, for different kinds of purposes. I will I'll talk about that in, 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 a, in a moment. So, what is ethnography? What is ethnography? The basic idea is that the researcher goes to the field, stays there and stays there as participant observer, almost as participant observer. The researcher tries to learn the language, try to assimilate himself or herself in the culture of that particular area and then they capture the ways of thinking, the ways of life of those people. And so, basically through this they capture a larger frame of thinking within which they resolve different issues. Once that broader frame is captured, then they write a story about the, the community. So, it is a, it is, it is a field based technique, but not about collection of information, but about understanding the thought process of that group or community. So, it is argued that unless you understand the thought process, there is a possibility that you pick up the data and interpret the data from your own point of view and you fail to understand how and what the community is actually thinking. There is a difference between case study and ethnography. A case study method which is very close to ethnography also stresses on the point that you have to go to the field, you have to stay in the field, you have to collect information from the field. So, you pick up one case which can be considered as a sample case of a particular kind of, uh, uh, of field that you want to uh, understand and in that case you collect all those information and then analyze and then generalize from there. Ethnography opposed to that does not emphasize on collecting information. It collects documents, it collects photographs, it collects memories, it collects stories, it collects very, very subjective things and then puts them together to make a larger story. That is the ethnographic method. So, ethnographers go and stay in the field for months and months, in fact for years and years. There is a professor called Anand Chakravarti who has worked on, in sociology and he has, he, he, has, he is a sociology professor, he has worked on one small block of Bihar to understand the power relations in agrarian society and he has worked for almost 10 years, a book that he has published after 10 years research. So, ethnography is long term research technique. So, you go there, stay there, understand them, participate them, confirm your understanding repeatedly several years you follow that, then you narrate a story 
which becomes a very similar story that anybody from there could be directing. And then within that story, you bring, bring out certain kind of theories. And you, you, you examine the theories that, that is existing, or you create a new theory about human society. There are many kinds of ethnography also. The one kind of ethnography is holistic ethnography. The holistic ethnography is something where in which you know the society in its totality. So, you go there, stay there, participate with them, understand their stories, understand their, their way of thinking and you narrate the story of the whole society. So, you, you, you try to communicate with the people in a way that it becomes very natural to them and that is how you completely capture their thought process. And there is another thing that is called semiotic uh, ethnography. Uh, Clifford Gage is one of the famous uh, thinkers who has uh, worked on various communities with this method. He suggests that instead of really becoming a participant observer of that kind, you can also collect the words, images, institutions, behavioral patterns and then sit down and analyze as an objective observer, not as somebody who is embedded in that. In the first kind of ethnography, in fact, the ethnographer is supposed to be em having empathy with the community, so that with the empathy they can actually experience exactly the way community is experiencing. So, a lot of emphasis on, uh, on experiential epistemology is there, but in the in the second kind of uh, ethnography, the semiotic kind of ethnography, you do not, you are not supposed to assimilate with them, you are not supposed to become so close to them that you start empathizing with them. You are there, you are participating, but basically you are observing, you are collecting certain kind of non, non technical data or you may say non numerical data. You are collecting photographs, you are collecting their paintings, you are collecting their stories, they are collecting their poetry. So, those things which you cannot collect otherwise, you are collecting that through ethnographic research. There could be a third kind of uh, ethnography in which uh, instead of really uh, doing, uh, instead of being empathetic to the community, you will only observe the behavior of the community. Instead of collecting those data also, you just do not do all these things, but just you go there and observe the behavior of the people. And by observing the behavior of the people, you derive certain conclusions. You can talk to them, you can uh, engage with them, you do not need to identify with them, you do not even need to collect a lot of semiotic symbols, you do not need to collect them, you just need to observe their behavior. So, that can be another way of and a lot of new experiments are taking place in ethnographic research as it is now expanding as the new disciplines are adopting ethnography. So, new ways of thinking are also emerging within this model of, of research. But the most important and most vibrant way of doing ethnography is the participant observer ethnography, the first kind I was talking where you are actually become part of that, where the researcher is so involved with the, with the community and, the, and not only the, 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 the researcher stays with the community, but also learns the language, participates with, with the community. You have an example of a professor from London School of Economics, John Harris, who was doing ethnographic research somewhere in South India and he finally uh, produced a very nice work on those areas. But also interesting thing to know is that he named his daughter uh, as Kaveri, the river around which the village was located uh, on which he was working. So, you find ethnographers almost converting themselves into the local person, almost converting themselves. They learn the language, they, they, they adopt the timetable of the local community, they participate in the uh, functions, they dress themselves the way the local community dresses themselves. So, they almost become close and this is the method which is supposed to be a typical ethnographic method or most powerful ethnographic method.
and this is this is very th therefore this is very different therefore this is very different than any other any other method of research in this actually the idea behind this is that the reality is is not fragmented it's a totality and the reality is constituted in the process of everyday life if the reality is constituted in the process of everyday life then to capture the reality you have to become part of the everyday life that is the basic idea so the ethnography ethnographic method that way is quite different than others other methods think that in the process of everyday life in the process of constituting the reality human beings generate certain symbols generate certain information generate certain kind of uh, representations and if you capture those representations through that you can go back to the reality that they are constituting ethnography believes that the process of constituting of reality is so complex and so dynamic that even if they leave the symbols behind you cannot reach to them only through the symbols. In fact, you have to become part of that evolution of social reality. So, therefore, it is very, very different kind of method. It, it emphasizes on the, on the nature of the social phenomena. It does not go with a hypothesis. It does not go with a workable uh, conceptual frame. It actually goes there without any frame of that kind and then once it starts interacting the people raises a the frame there in this community itself then it tries to compare its own knowledge with the existing knowledge so therefore ethnography is something which is almost a fundamental research about human beings almost a fundamental research about human beings where you engage with the social reality at the lowest possible level and try to theorize that reality in a big way. So, you do not go there with a questionnaire, you do not go with a structured interview, you do not go with, uh, with anything which somebody can locate you as a researcher. You in fact go there, start staying and start participating, start participating with them, you attract their attention, you make them friend, you become so close to them that they start sharing their ideas with you. You are no more an alien there. So, your instruments of data collection you do not use there. Of course, film making has become a big tool of ethnographic research. We will talk about it in the next lecture, but we go with very unstructured framework to work there. You do not go with anything which is already existing. So, the information that you collect are mostly subjective information. So, what do you do there then? How do you collect information? Where do you put them? The most important tool of the ethnographic research is the diary, the ethnographer's diary. So, ethnography is ethnographer is supposed to maintain a diary where he or she puts down all the reflections that he has every day. So, it is the every day's record of his or her perception of that society and to the highest possible detail to the maximum possible detail and this diary of ethnographer is actually supposed to be the most authentic evidence of research in fact somebody may ask a question that what is the guarantee that you have actually captured the reality that you have actually been objective in your research in the sense that maybe you are not really you are cooking up a story the story does not have any basis the ethnographer's diary is the record which has a scientific value that diary is considered to be the most authentic record in fact what happens sometimes that researchers uses researchers use others diary to reconstruct the reality and sometimes people you this diary is so is considered to be so much so much authentic that nobody questions the findings of the ethnographer. There are many benefits of ethnography and I think uh, let, let me mention that to start with then I will go, go to the examples of ethnographic research and the problems that one faces in ethnographic research. Uh, one that it is very in depth 
study. Ethnography is a very, very in-depth study. It is, it is not superficial study in the sense that you are not trying to capture the reality only through your minimal interaction. For instance, if I am conducting a survey research, what I will do? I will send my surveyors to collect data. They will bring data, put them on the computer. They will make tables for me and I will start looking for the interconnections between the information that I have got in the data table. Ethnography is not like that. Ethnography is extremely intensive. You follow human beings in the community where you are living very, very deeply. So, you in fact use techniques of psychoanalysis sometimes that you, you um, psychoanalysis not in a technical sense I am saying psychoanalysis I am saying only as, uh, as something called a talking, talking technique that you allow the people to talk and you record those things, you write reflections on those things. So, it is very authentic in the sense that you have lived there, you have experienced that and you have you have uh, uh, analyzed them. So, that way ethnography is a very, very powerful method. It is very difficult to counter the ethno ethnographic research or challenge the ethnographic research, but it has many limitations also. Obviously, it takes too much of time. It has uh, too, many, too much of subjectivity. It has, I mean, same ethnographer if he is sent to the same place twice may get a very different kind of understanding. And of course, it, it depends on how much time have you have you spent there. And also the bigger problem is that the assimilation is not an easy thing to happen. It is not very easy to assimilate. I give you an example. There was a research going on conducted by National Labor Institute of Delhi. In the National Labor Institute, Vivigri National Labor Institute, and the research team was in the field. They were working on uh, bonded labor, and they were unable to get any clue, any information. Now, a professor who was the director of the research, he decided to go there himself. And when he reached there, he asked somebody about the village. And he picked up his luggage on his head and, he start, and, and left the station. Now, by the time he reached the village, everybody was surprised that who is this man coming who is well dressed, but not using coolie for carrying his luggage, he is like carrying his luggage himself. And the professor did not meet the research team. He went there and met somebody and said that I want to stay here a couple of nights, and they agreed. And the whole village was there. He started talking to the village, listening to their stories, narrating new stories. He cooked up a story about his travel to the village. After two, three days, he became very close to the people. And then he, dis then he kind of explained to them that why was he there. And then he introduced them to the team. And the team became very close to the people. And they started moving around. And they could get some data. So these are the things that, will, that may happen in the ethnographic research. So, assimilation itself is not an easy thing and particularly if you belong to a different culture and obviously, you are working on different culture. A white man going to a Bastar village or going to a, a Haryana village trying to work on something is so, so located that assimilation does not become very easy. I myself was working in a village in Bihar and there was a lady with me who was from Germany. And both of us were working on uh, a project called Mapping Knowledge and Practice in Asia. Now, the moment she is there, a lot of people located her uh, as a foreigner, and they were not interested in divulging, if, uh, divulging everything. They were not interested in talking about, they were more interested in talking about Germany than about their own village. So, it took two, three days, in fact, to have an easy relationship with the people. And gradually, we got little bit of closeness to the villagers and got some information. So, it is not an easy thing 
to assimilate. And it, at times what happens is that you are staying there for months and months and years and yet you are unable to capture the epistemic frame of the community. The other thing is the language. No matter how much you work to, to learn a language which is so obscure, which is spoken mainly by one small community it becomes a difficult thing to handle. Many, many scholars try to do that, but not always and they are not always successful. I give an example. We were in Punjab village trying, there was a project on conflict resolution. It was uh, uh, called institution and conflict in Punjab. And in the village, we wanted to talk about the violence. For months and months, we tried, we did not get much information. Then one evening, we were sitting with some people, we explored, we told them that we are from the university and we had a nice chat. Then the fellow invited us for dinner and during the dinner, we became very close to them and then they started telling us the problem that Punjab faced. And this process could be possible only because this time we took a couple of persons with us who could speak their language. So, the language itself is very important and learning language is not an easy thing. Let me take some examples to uh, suggest how um, ethnography really works. Uh, there, is, there is a story that a foreign a, student, a, a researcher, a, foreign, 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 a, a white researcher came to India, came to, to Maharashtra and wanted to work on the, the role of women in that society. She says that the first thing she did, she realized that unless she could change her dress, nobody was ready to talk to her. So, what she did, she started wearing sari. And after some time, see, it was difficult to distinguish her from the local community except by color. She learned the language, she changed her dress, she started staying with them, some months, few months she took in getting adjusted. But once that happened, then they started getting a lot of information. So, this is, this is the way you work in the ethnographic research. In the ethnographic research, you do not treat them as an object of research in a way the other researchers treat them. You become part of their being, you become part of their understanding. And they st once you become part of their being, once you have the language, once you have the dress, you start enjoying that community and the community also start enjoying your company. And in that process only the truth is revealed. So, it is very complex, pro ethnography is a very, very complex process. Yes. Sorry, I would like to ask you, as you said in the beginning that uh, uh, researcher in ethnography research, they do not seek information, rather they seek practices and pattern what is being followed in a certain society where they go and like they collect images, the stories and all that. So, in that case, the goal with which the researcher go, how they can uh, um, uh, discern the difference between the, whether this will meet our goal or not because a large number of uh, uh, practices are in any society. So, we have to final, uh, we have to first discern which one is helpful for me and which one is not helpful for me. Generally what uh, happens, especially when, uh, for the new research. Yeah, generally what happens when the researcher goes there in the village or in the, in the community, they, they do not go with a very defined hypothesis in ethnographic research because their aim is to conduct, construct a story about the village. So, it, it is not a very defined focused uh, okay. hypothesis, right. So, what they do and in that process of constructing a story, mm -hmm. you get certain very interesting ideas. And once you suppose you are trying to construct a story, you take took 6 months to learn their language, being empathetic to them, staying with them, living the way they are living and then you discover that you are 
almost close to constructing a story of the community that how does the community think about the reality, what are the problems the community is facing, what are the issues one can talk about. Once you get those issues, then mm. you may take lead on certain issues. Okay. So, right. we can't uh, in the beginning uh, decide which kind of uh, research we are going because we need to first we have to finalize the objective. So, uh, at that uh, stage uh, also be design a research design. So, whether it will be a ethnographic uh, method we adopted or survey method we adopted. So, how can… Now, let me give you an example, a concrete example of this. Okay. Say, I mentioned about the Punjab, Punjab uh, research. This was research was uh, conflict and institutional change in Punjab. Okay. Uh, our problem was we wanted to know whether the conflict in Punjab was, was a result of failures of two major institutions, okay. the political party and the property regime. Mm -hmm. So, that was our purpose. We wanted to explore that. Now, how to do that? How to find out if Punjab crisis had any link with the political party? Obviously, we wanted to know whether people respected political party, they participated with political party, how did they look at the political party? Mm -hmm. That was the one issue. Okay. And second was, how far the property regime in Punjab was responsible for change in the property regime in Punjab was responsible for this kind of crisis. Now, these were the two main things now. So, when we went there, obviously, we wanted to know whether land rights, la whether land pattern had changed or not, mm -hmm. how much is the membership of the political party. These are the data which we could get offhand from different sources. So, these data we collected. Now, when we reached there, we did not try to really push these two questions to start with. We started, we, we picked up a couple of stories, a couple of st uh, districts. We sampled two districts, mm -hmm. then we sampled two villages. Now, in the village, we wanted to construct a story. What happened during the conflict? On the basis of secondary data? Uh, no, secondary data gave us the basic idea about Punjab situation. Okay. It also gave us some idea which areas were more conflict region. So, we selected some date village from those areas. Now, when we reached to that village, mm -hmm. then we abandoned all these things. Then our aim was to construct a story of a village, what happened during the conflict mm -hmm. and what happened after the conflict. While constructing the story of the village between those that period of conflict, mm -hmm. see. So, we discovered that well, uh, Gurdwara was constructed. We discovered that there was a migration from that village of the bigger landlords. We discovered that there were families which were starving due to failure of the crops during the green, after the Green Revolution collapse. We discovered that large number of cases were there in the village due to conflict about the land rights, whose, whose ownership is established on the land. So, we collected all these things and we then we narrated a story that how in this period, what happened in this village. Mm -hmm. okay? So, once we narrated, constructed the story, then we started looking for our own problems. Our problem was the whether they become party of, uh, uh, part of the political party or okay, not. Okay, it means you just uh, put up all these uh, different bits at one place and a larger picture. Then you try to fit out your picture fit there. Exactly. But then once I have a larger picture of the village, okay. then I start looking for my part of the picture. Okay. Where is that located? Okay. Are we really and getting some idea that mm -hmm. and, and the, dis, the conclusion that we derived was that in fact the conflict has deep relation with mm -hmm. the uh, land rights two in two ways. One, what happened in the green revolution period that the income increased prior to green revolution you had moderate income but a very strong social relationship. Okay. In the green revolution period gradually the social relationship got converted into wage relationship. Okay. So, you have migrant laborers working there. So, villages were poor villages were out from the land relations. And then when the green revolution collapsed, the profit started going down. That really created a crisis. They had tremendous uh, expenditure pattern. It's the growth of expenditure was like anything. The status symbol uh, status was attached to various kinds of social functions. Mm -hmm. So, their expenditure were high, uh, income became very low. 
Yeah. And that resulted into this kind of serious problem of conflict. Now, this information we could not have got by any other means okay. except by narrating the whole total story. Similarly, we, we have a, had a comparative project with Kashmir in a Kashmir village uh, called Tulamula village. Tulamula village has a famous Khir Bhavani temple. Yeah. We were in the Khir Bhavani temple uh, in, in the Tulamula village. We selected two villages there also, one with high conflict, one with low conflict. And then we started trying to narrate a story why conflict became very high in that particular village. It was not because there was a temple in that village, therefore there was conflict. In fact, surprisingly, yeah. the temple was a common place for both Hindus and Muslims in the village and they used to go. Uh, the real problem was that the high conflict village had high land ownership in the sense that few people owned maximum chunk of the land. Okay. So, these are the, the, then they started telling us the story about what prior to conflict what happened and what role did the landlord play in, in the conflict period. So, you create a story and then while creating the story, you start looking for your own things in that. So, ethnography is a much larger uh, canvas that you create during ethnographic research. Okay. So, one more thing I would like to understand. Because um, when you interact with the people, there are some certain, uh, some true story, but in some cases, cooked up a story also come up. So, uh, a researcher, how can they make a difference between whether this is a true story, a cooked up story? Because they note down all the things, as you said, that the ethnographer's diary and all this. So, uh, after some times, it's not possible to, uh, uh, in fact, distinguish between. Both. No, you know what happens that when yeah. the ethnographer is taking note in the diary, it is not only documenting what has happened today, okay. but also reflection on that. Okay. So, while documenting the ethnographer will always keep on talking about that which particular thing the ethnographer has a doubt about, mm -hmm. he wants to explore it further, who has said what, how authentic it is. So, it is a kind of full reflection. Cross examination. Cross examination takes place okay. and, then, and then while narrating the story, you use all information. You say that these, these people said this, but then I inquired from this person and this is a counter story that came up. I then wanted to confirm this counter story with somebody else. So, you actually are a storyteller. Ethnographer is in a way a storyteller that he tells the whole story and then churns out his own things from that. Okay. So, uh, this is one aspect about the problem. Uh, now, we want to know from the ethnographer's point of view, what are the dilemma they face? Yeah. The ethnographers face many dilemma in fact. The, the biggest dilemma is that uh, how far one can understand the other's point of view. You know, uh, ethnographer is trained in a particular discipline, is, is trained with certain kind of theoretical frame and when he reaches or she reaches to the field, mm. she is expected to understand other epistemic community. Now, understanding the other epistemic community, every point the ethnographer feels is based on one's own understanding. So, there is a dilemma between the existing frame of thinking changing frame of reference and, and the changing frame of reference. So, how far one can uh, accommodate the two, okay. that I think is one of the major uh, dilemma. The other thing that happens with ethnography is that the the question of authenticity. I think yes, of course, we are noting down in the diary and the diary is considered to be authentic this thing, but the bigger problem is that how, how would you bring evidences to the community, to the community of scholars who has never been to the village, who has never been to that particular area. Okay. So, uh, suppose I conduct an ethnography in a Kashmir village hmm. and I come back and present my result before a community of scholars in JNU who, have, who has not even seen that place. So, how do I claim the authenticity of the knowledge? That is a big problem. So, the evidence is what kind of evidence am I going to give to the community? I think that is another dilemma that they keep facing. And also, in collecting the evidence, there are several things. That is why you see some kind of researchers say that no, no, we just want to collect those subjective evidences. Mm -hmm. Of course, we do not want to collect the data. We do not want to bring the data uh, for research, but we want to bring those subjective evidences, uh, text and other things, okay. so that we can use those things for analysis and that becomes our evidence. 
So, that is that remains a major issue that how uh, how do you uh, bring home the point that you want to make and support that with right kind of evidences. That I think is a major, major dilemma. But sometimes also what happens you know uh, when you are uh, doing ethnographic research, it is so lengthy process that it takes time even to arrive on some conclusion and you may fail to really uh, to, to capture certain basic things just because of, of the fact that it takes time to understand the linguistic structure. Okay. So, that is, a, that is another dilemma that how far you are actually capturing it. So, these are the dilemma of ethno ethnographic research, but by and large it seems that ethnographers are those who are trained properly are capable of observing things very fast and taking note of the things and concluding those things. But there are many jokes about ethnographers that they sometimes capture very silly things and start theorizing that. The how do people hold the cups? Even that becomes an ethnographic information. Okay. So, sometimes they are very uh, uh, funny, funny uh, ideas that ethnographers bring up. Which is not relevant for the uh, research. Not relevant, but the thing it is anything is relevant because they, they want to connect everything. If they want so, to make it. <laughs> yeah. So, there is yeah. a lot of lot of interconnections they want to work out. Okay. Sometimes it, this becomes very, very uh, funny. Uh, yeah. Okay. One question uh, I would like to ask you here. Uh, suppose we follow a certain other method of research and find uh, and reach to the conclusion uh, different. Uh, and if we follow the uh, uh, same problem and do ethnographic research, we come to a certain other conclusion. So, the contradiction between two conclusions how one can reflect upon this or come to uh, a very good question. You know, that is therefore, what is being done these days that instead of adopting only one method, mm -hmm. you adopt multiple methods. So, what you do is you start with your empirical research based on survey, you conduct a survey. There are two ways of doing it. One is that you conduct an ethnographic research first, you know the language, you know the area, you know the field. Then after conducting a full ethnographic research, you also conduct a survey research, so that you can check your, your uh, findings with the survey research. And if there is a gap, then you can find out what would be the reason for the gap. I give you an example for this. When we were working on Kashmir, uh, we did both the things. We had a kind of ethnographic research, we stayed there, talked to the people, collected their stories, lot of stories, wanted to connect the story and have a larger picture. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we also collected some data, survey data. Now, uh, when we used to clean the survey data in the morning, we discovered that in most of the uh, questionnaires, people have talked about their income and their exp expenditure in a very interesting way. And the expenditure is very high, the income is very low. Mm -hmm. So, we were surprised. Uh, we said that now this is uh, information that we have to uh, ex check. So, we go and we should check this information. So, during our ethnographic research, we started asking this question. The how do you manage your family? Your expenditure is so high, your income is so low, what do you do? Mm -hmm. And then we discovered that Kashmir has a huge problem of black money. So, what do you want to talk about the real income? Okay. The money is flowing in Kashmir through various means. And that money is being circulated in Kashmir, various parts of Kashmir, and therefore, we have no idea about the real relationship between income and the expenditure. Similarly, uh, say in Punjab, when we were there, we collected a set of data from the villages about the education, but when we compared that with occupation, we found no relationship. So, during our ethnographic research, we started raising this question that well, it is such a highly educated village, but why people are not working? Mm. Then they told us that in fact, for the emergent, during the emergency period, during that conflict period, the schools and colleges were given instruction that do not fail anybody, pass everybody. So, even without going to the school or college, you get a degree. So, Punjab produced large chunk of unemployable youth, they cannot be employed anywhere. Then we asked them what are they doing then and I am talking of when, I am talking of around uh, 
the year 2001 or 2. And that time the symptoms were very clear that th there will be a huge growth in the drug consumption in Punjab society. And now when I last year went there, I discovered that that has become that, that is true. So, youth in Punjab, they were unemployable, they could not even migrate to get their employment. So, large number of them migrated to foreign countries, even for a smaller works, but those who were left out, they started consuming drugs. The drug consumption has, rate has gone up like anything in Punjab. So, so many things, so many, uh, uh, so many things you can get through one kind of research and confirm or go deeper into it through other kind of research. So, these maybe, kind of maybe this multiple kind of yeah. uh, research uh, where you conducted that is in one pocket, pocket but it can't generalize it to the all uh, over the Yeah, region. generalization is a problem. Generalization in ethnography mm -hmm. I think is a problem uh, and they do not claim that they are making a general theory. I do not think that they generally claim that they are making a general theory, mm -hmm. but you know how do we generalize? When do we sample one village? Sampling means what? We have 50 villages about which we have almost same kind of information, same kind of data. Mm -hmm. So, we are picking up one of the villages out of those 50 on certain grounds that it can be considered as representative village or representative area or representative population and then we conduct the research on that. Since it is a sample, it is a kind of a part of that larger whole. So, we can generalize to some extent. We can narrate a story, but we can say that the story is almost repeated in various areas. So, there is a the generalization is not a very big problem, it is a problem, but not a very big problem for ethnographic research. Okay. So, uh, in uh, many cases do you find that uh, the result is the same or uh, differs? No, it is not the question of same or different result. I think it is question of going into different layers of the reality. Okay. See, each method I think allows you to enter into a new layer of reality. So, the, the survey method gives you certain kind of information about the village or about the reality and you can have a kind of data analysis of that. You can say certain things very certainly and many things you cannot say very certainly. For instance, if Durkheim is working on suicide and collecting a large data and then showing a trend and the relationship between religious group and the suicide rate, that is not, it is not that that method is wrong, it is not to say that that method is useless. But through, through this method, we cannot enter into the, into the deeper layer of human consciousness. After all, what happens when they commit suicide? why a particular community is prone to committing suicide. There could be one kind of relationship between the two phenomenon and resulting into this kind of thing, but for a deeper layer, I think you have to conduct undertake a case study method or an ethnographic method. What is different between case study and ethnography? As I said. Not as apparently, but in deeper level. Yeah, at a deeper level, I think yeah. ethnography goes into the question of epistemology. You know, like when I am analyzing your behavior, there could be two ways of analyzing it. Mm -hmm. One is that I observe your behavior and from my own point of thinking, I analyze your behavior. Other is that I understand how do you think and then I analyze the behavior. Take an example, take an example. I have taken a decision, say any, any decision I have taken. And I have taken a decision to help a friend of mine. Now, if somebody who is a very selfish person who thinks that nobody helps any other person without having any selfish motive will analyze my action in terms of selfishness and will try to find out after all what is my selfish motive behind helping my friend. Okay? But it is entirely possible that I am a very altruist and I enjoy helping my friends and therefore, I have helped my friend. So, now if you understand my viewpoint better, then you will think about my this action very differently. Same is true about the society. What happens in society? 
that take take example of say sati pratha when the big debate in the in the 1829 or so when the sati was abolished in India. What was the argument that some people were giving? Some people were saying that those who were observing from outside, they were saying, oh, this is a very, very bad practice, which is no, there is no doubt about it that this is a bad practice. But those who were arguing from within, they were saying that you do not even understand this practice, because there is a logic of it, that is the internal logic of it. The kind of marriage system that we have where we completely commit to the other person. So, we cannot even think of our other life, uh, our life without the other person, therefore we commit this kind of thing. So, it is this argument is always there that a community is thinking about something in a very different way, because it has a very different epistemic frame. So, to understand the behavior of that community, to predict the behavior of the community, what is necessary is to understand the way they are thinking about themselves. So, ethnography based is based on this idea and when you capture this epistemic frame, what you call the organizing principle of society, then probably you can predict lot of things, then probably you can connect lot of their behavioral pattern with that particular organizing principle. The case study does not do it, case study thinks that there, there is a pattern in this area, I want to pick up one small section and want to prove that and, and want to explore the pattern, want to theorize that pattern. So, instead of considering that as an epistemic community, I, the case study is based more on the regularities, they capture the regularity and if the regularity is there, they will theorize that. So, case study does not go deeper into the collective consciousness, case, case study does not go deeper into the issue of the epistemic community, it does not treat the case as an epistemic community. Ethnography treats the case, the group as an, as, as, an, as, a, as an epistemic community. So, it tries to understand the epistemic frame of the community and then tries to actually theorize that. That I think is a major difference between the two. Okay, that one should understand while doing both the methods. That is right and therefore, uh, ethnography initially has been used for cultural studies. Okay. The culture is something that is being produced by that epistemic uh, uh, frame. So, they think the culture since it is produced by epistemic frame, so the other culture you cannot understand without understanding the epistemic frame. Case study is not used mainly for cultural studies, the culture they, they study uh, uh, so through some the temporary the, things. Yeah, tem yeah, exactly some patterns. Yeah. Yeah. What is going on That's right. in current situation and all exactly. this. Exactly. Uh, but if you want to compare to uh, culture, then we can also use this. Uh, ethnographic method, yeah. that is very important. Most of the ethnographers are actually into studying the culture, but of late now, uh, the political studies mm. groups are also picking up ethnography, because for instance, the elections, see the elections, mm -hmm. even if we have huge data and we want to say that, well, this is what is happening in the election, mm. but we cannot say that, how does it happen? Why do we? Uh, we, we may assume that in particular state, the voting pattern is mainly based on the caste. So, through the survey, we can find out, okay, this is a person from this caste and supporting this particular candidate and the ground that he or she is giving is the caste. So, we can have a kind of data about this and conclude on that, but okay. we cannot understand why do they vote for the caste, what happens there, what kind of debate goes on when they decide to vote for the caste and that is the crucial thing that political scientists are finding uh, ethnography very, very useful to decipher these kind of things. Why do they vote for the particular Any example particular. can you cite conducted recently? Yeah, I told you about this CSDS research, they have started conducting this kind of research now and mm -hmm. trying to find out uh, different uh, areas, they, they sample different areas mm -hmm. and in those areas they try to see how, what is the behavioral of voters and how that behavior is being decided, how, why do they behave like that, the way they behave. It is entirely possible that, uh, that the modern democracy thinks that people will behave as an individual, hmm. but actually those areas, we do not behave as an individual, we behave as a community. So, we decide to vote as community, 
Now, there is a very interesting example when the researcher uh, initial years of uh, this ethological uh, studies, a researcher came from US and went to a village, went to a constituency, came back, conducted a kind of um, uh, press conference and declared that so and so will be victorious as, as, as discovered by, deciphered by the scientific method of psychology. This is a scientific method, you collected data, authenticity, everything was maintained. When the result came, uh, the fellow lost his security. So, that was a very big, big puzzle for him. Then he went back to the constituency and uh, discovered that there was something, he was a foreigner, so he did not know much about this area. So, he was told a story that what happened that on the eve of election uh, in a mosque, uh, somebody threw something uh, which was looking like uh, beef and uh, sorry, uh, the, the pig, pig's body and in a, in a temple, somebody threw something like uh, beef and that created a big problem in that area and ultimately the whole uh, vote got crystallized uh, or divided into two, two parts and then something happened. So, this fellow was very surprised at what happened, what, what is this beef and pig and what happened with his temple and mosque and he did not know about that. Mm -hmm. So, he had no idea. So, if he had, if he would have done an ethnographic research in that area, he would have known that well this is a very communally sensitive area and the pattern of voting will de depend on many things and it might change in the last moment. You never know when yeah. it will change. You cannot have survey conducted even uh, two days before the election and say that well uh, my result will be authentic because they have actually uh, voted for them in my box, the box I put there. So, it is very difficult to say. So, ethnography is being discovered these days as a very, very uh, nice method even for uh, political research apart from the cultural research. And there are many such examples we will discover uh, in which uh, scholars are using now ethnography research. Let me give another example, two examples and uh, one is uh, one of the students of mine is working on uh, conflict and peace in Gujarat. Now, if you go to Gujarat and try to talk to the people, uh, her, her, let me let me tell you her, her, her project. She, she wants to find out that even during the conflict and after the conflict, are there examples of good relations between two communities? Because her point is that the reports, newspaper reports, the, the, the media and re newspaper reports, the committee reports, these reports are, uh, are uh, have the starting point, the terms of reference uh, of fixing the responsibility, who is responsible. So, they actually highlight only those stories which are conflict stories, but are there some stories which are non-conflict stories, which are peace stories in this area. So, if we uh, suppose she could conduct a survey, she would not get this, she looks at the newspaper clippings, content analysis, she would not get that. But when she went there, started interacting with the people, stayed in certain areas, had deep interaction with them, then she could discover that there are certain stories of this kind of relationship too. The story is very different compared to the story being presented by the media. Similarly, somebody is working on religion and uh, conflict in uh, Gorakhpur area. So, in that area, uh, if you go there and conduct a survey, uh, you would not understand why suddenly Gorakhpur has become so sensitive area. Now, what is the role being played by various institutions there? So, this person has stayed there, has documented the language being used by the people have taken photographs, have interacted with various kinds of people, have attended various kinds of meetings and melas and everything. And then he is trying to see how in the everyday life, in the everyday life, there is a deep relationship between political economy and conflict and religion. That deep interaction between these cannot be, cannot come out through any other means. Okay. Right. Similarly, there is a third kind of research which I think is very interesting is about how water as a natural resource is being perceived by people 
so she tried to do this by examining the movements. What is the rallying point of the movement? What is the concept of natural resource that these movements are using for mobilizing people? And then she discovered that that the concept of natural resource is very different than the modern bourgeois natural resource, concept of natural resource. The idea is that the water is a natural resource for everybody, every human being. Okay. It should be available to every human being. Right. So, you have this, these kind of research can be done through ethnographic so research. So, ethnography is a very useful for understanding the deeper layer of the problem. So, well friends, with this word we conclude the lecture. I thank all of you for watching the lecture and on your behalf I thank Dr. M. A. Thakur for giving such an insightful lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.